Hey, Brendan. Morning. Can everyone see this okay? Yep. Perfect. Yes, I think there's a mode, Luca, where the um, uh, everyone's cursor goes away. Um, I'm trying to remember how you get to that. Hold on a sec. That's not it. Isn't it just full screen? I think there's, you actually have to add something to the URL. Hold on. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I'll send you the link. It's the view for web version. That's what I just did. You did view for web? Yeah. Although I think I just broke it. Yeah, click the click the link I just sent. It's like slash pub for publish. I just sent you the link in the thread on the um, <clears throat> product channel. Thanks. Can you, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, hey, James. Loud and clear. All right, something is not working for me. Uh. That's great, yeah. That's cool. that's the one I like to use. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yep. yep. Okay, I can finally hear you. I was in here before and it wasn't working at all. You're all good. Hey, I'll be right back, team. Okay.
All right, happy Monday, folks. Um, welcome to GitLab's release kickoff for 12.1. My name is Luca Williams, and I'm the product manager for GitLab's fulfillment group. I will be your MC for today's call. Um, for those of you who haven't attended one of these before, over the next 30 minutes, each product manager will talk about some of the highlights and exciting features of their stage. I'd also like to welcome Scott Williamson. He's our new VP of product. I think this is his first kickoff call, right, Scott? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Happy to have you. Um, before I pass over to our first speaker, Virginia, I want to remind folks that we do plan ambitiously at GitLab, so please bear in mind that it's possible that some of these issues may not ship in time for 12.1, which will be released on July 22nd. Over to you, Virginia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luca. So I'm uh, Virginia and I'm the Senior Product Manager for uh, Measure, which is one of our, uh, one of our groups. Um, as um, we mentioned during our last kickoff call, we are doubling down on our efforts to create an analytical framework focused on improving the transparency and efficiency across the development lifecycle. In many organizations, engineering and product teams span multiple groups and projects, while most of our analytics, unfortunately, uh, have been on a project level, which makes it very difficult to get a sense of where the majority of engineering and product manager effort is spent. We've definitely heard your feedback, uh, and while our final goal is to move all analytics to a top-level organizational level, in the spirit of our incremental approach to building and focus on velocity, we are creating um, a group level engineering productivity dashboard and moving some of our improvements to psychoanalytics to a group level. While our vision for psychoanalytics includes work on value stream management mapping uh, and customizable workflows and stages, we're kicking off some of the group level visualization work and trend analysis with the existing stages that we have already defined. We will also enable filtering per project, date range, and where applicable milestone uh, or author. Um, and the third, uh, the third issue that we have here is productivity analytics. Um, we believe that by deep diving uh, into productivity analytics, you, the engineering will basically allow engineering managers to understand how well they're deployed, deploying resources and spot patterns across individuals and projects. Productivity can slow down for many reasons, ranging from degrading code base to positive things like quickly growing teams. And we're thrilled to start the journey on how to best convey important problematic or exemplary patterns across individuals and teams. The first version will be an MVC and will involve mainly histograms and trends focused on the time to complete an MR, but we have a very long way ahead of us. Um, because of that, we, we ask you um, to please comment and provide us any, any feedback is welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Virginia. Who doesn't love data, huh? Um, over to Eric for plan. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I appreciate that. Uh, so for plan, <clears throat> we've got a number of improvements coming to both boards and epics. Uh, so the first two issues there are, are obviously targeted at boards. One of the things that you can't do today in a board is collapse a list in a board, which means if you have probably four or five boards at once, you can't see the end of, um, of the board view, which is typically the closed column, uh, which means it's really difficult to drag issues from, say, a column or a list on the left-hand side all the way to the closed uh, column for boards. And so <clears throat> uh, what we're going to do is provide an ability to collapse a board list which should let you, one, drag issues farther over to the right on a board, but also uh, will let you visually indicate which lists are most important in a given board. So super excited about that. And then in addition to, to uh, improvements uh, on collapsing lists, we're also going to let um, our users move multiple issues at the same time uh, amongst board lists. Uh, this is a really painful thing to do right now in, uh, in boards, if you've used them for any amount of time. It's difficult to, uh, if you have, say, 10 issues that all need to be moved from one list to another at the same time, you have to do that individually. We want to make group actions um, a better experience inside of boards. And so we'll be doing that by allowing you to do a multi-select uh, for move it, moving issues amongst board lists. We also have a number of epic improvements coming, uh, primarily starting with um, inheriting epic due dates. So one of the things we, we didn't do when we um, released child epics a few months back was allow the children to uh, give their due dates to their parents. And so in this release, um, parent epics will inherit their children epics due dates, which will allow for much better project management all the way down to the issue level. And then there's two other things that we're going to allow uh, from epics this release, which is creating an issue from an epic and then creating a child epic from an epic, which will allow for top-down planning. Oftentimes, at least I know when I get an idea in my head, and our customers have also validated this, you start with an epic 
And then you think of all the tasks that you need to add to that epic. And right now it's a very disparate and, and confusing, disorganizing experience in GitLab where you have to go make a bunch of issues and then you have to kind of make sure that you have the issue links um, you know, up in, in other tabs and then you copy and paste those and you add those as related things in, into an issue or in an epic. Uh, and what we're going to do here is we're going to let you very easily make and create a top-down plan, starting with an epic, adding a child epic if you want, but then absolutely going into issues so you can stub out an entire project very easily. Luca, over to you for fulfillment. Thanks, Eric. Some really exciting stuff happening in, in plan by the looks of things. Um, so for fulfillment, uh, we're making some further iterations on notifications for our CI run a minutes um, add-on purchases. So we are currently working on trying to implement how users can uh, be notified in, in various different ways once they're about to hit their quota limit, which is going to help big time when um, people are running lots of pipelines um, and constantly hitting those limits. We want to be able to let people know in good time. Um, and then the second one is self-service upgrades for gitlab.com users. Uh, up until now, we have not had the ability for users to upgrade their gitlab.com plan by themselves. They have to reach out to a GitLab team member. So I'm really excited to announce that we're going to be able to do this pretty soon. Um, over to James for create. Thank you, Luca. Uh, the first uh, item to draw your attention to for the source code group in the create stage of the DevOps lifecycle is uh, the ability to specify merge order um, across projects. Um, so this is very important for large projects that are split up into multiple sub projects. So this is particularly common um, if you've migrated a monolithic application that was maybe stored in a Perforce Depot or something like that, and you've moved, migrated it to GitLab, and there's sort of dependencies between the different projects, um, and being able to specify the merge order allows you to coordinate the merge process um, between the different projects and make sure that you don't break the build in the process of doing that. Um, so we're hopeful that the first iteration will ship in 12.1. The next issue is um, with regards to providing a streamlined approach for resolving confidential issues through a confidential merge request. And the way we're doing this is using a fork um, that's private. And so resolving confidential issues in a confidential way is really important for open source projects. Um, it's critical when a security vulnerability is reported that in the process of fixing it and resolving the issue, that you don't leak the issue itself. Sometimes it can take quite a while to find the right fix and make sure that it's fully tested and mitigated. Um, and so using a private fork, uh, there's going to be a streamlined confidential merge request workflow. And finally, a frequently requested um, and really great improvement to code owners is coming. Currently, you can specify lists of people that are responsible for different areas of your code base, but you'll also now be able to specify groups. Um, and when you use a code owners file, you can see the ownership when you browse the repository and it also automatically assigns um, and requires approval depending on your configuration for merge requests uh, when using a code owners file. Kai, over to you. Thanks, James. So uh, for the editor group inside of the create stage, uh, we're going to continue working on live preview in the web IDE in 12.1. So um, we've got a lot of exciting things here happening with being able to uh, mirror changes that happen in the web IDE, output those to the terminal and render that in real time, um, which should make editing and working on projects and doing tests um, that much better inside of the web IDE. So we're continuing the work on that. Uh, in the knowledge group of the create stage, we're continuing the work on design management. So we're shipping uh, a very small MVC in 12.0 that allows uh, users to upload um, designs. Um, and along with that, we now are going to continue iterating and adding uh, comments and discussions to those items. Uh, and then the other thing that we're bringing into the knowledge stage is the previous version. So as these discussions happen and changes are made, it's very important that those conversations continue to happen and we are able to compare the changes that happened on previous versions to the new versions to make sure the right changes are being made uh, as those designs continue to move along. So on to Brendan for the Verify. Great, thanks Kai. Uh, so there's two issues uh, that we're really delighted to be bringing uh, with Verify this time around. Uh, the first is the generic executor for the GitLab runner. Uh, this is something that's going to be an extremely powerful primitive uh, that we're hoping 
uh, to use for a couple of known use cases, but we also think is going to uh, expand the use cases for GitLab CI and the runner in general. Uh, what this will allow folks to do is to prepare and modify the environment prior to the running of the runner. This will allow people that have maybe hardware or licensed software that we might not have access to as maintainers of the GitLab runner project to expand GitLab runner and use it in those environments. So use cases such as high performance computing, uh, virtualization tools that we don't uh, use or own here at GitLab, uh, this will open up the ability for users to use the GitLab runner uh, much easier and more effectively in those environments. Uh, second is group, re group level required CI jobs for uh, requiring and include at the group level. So in GitLab 12.0, we brought uh, the ability to uh, require um, uh, jobs at the instance level. Uh, this will allow folks to have an auditable trail of a job that runs on every pipeline. Uh, but bringing it to the group level makes it more flexible for our self-managed users and also enables our GitLab.com SaaS users to use this feature. So uh, we're really uh, thrilled to be bringing that uh, in uh, 12.1. Luca? Thanks, Brendan. Um, over to Tim for package. Thanks, Luca. There's two features which I'm really excited to share for uh, our upcoming milestone. The first is add support for C, C++ developers to build, deploy, and publish their packages to our package registry on GitLab. Um, so if you're a C or C++ developer and you start using this MVC, I'd love to hear from you um, and get more feedback, how we can make that feature more useful in the future. And the second is we're starting to improve our NPM uh, integration. We've heard a lot of feedback about users having problems with it, not being able to use it from subgroups. So this issue will enable uh, organizations that are taking advantage of groups and subgroups to be able to publish and deploy NPM packages. So hopefully this helps a lot of people unblock or unblocks a lot of people from using this feature. That's it for me, Karina. Awesome, Tim, thank you. Over to Karina for release. Thank you. Uh, yes, in release stage, we are excited to bring forward a few new capabilities, um, starting with the parallel execution strategy of merge trains. Um, if some of you remember from our last release, this is the, the next iteration of our merge trains MBC. Um, in the last release, the MVC was first uh, focused on the sequential uh, train of MRs, meaning one at a time. In this release, we are moving towards a more efficient target method and managing trains that will allow sequenced MRs to run in parallel pipelines with the initial working assumption that all will pass to maximize the uh, pipeline time. Um, to ensure we're not allowing a failed change in the train, we will maintain an orderly delivery to the target branch by not allowing the failed items and previous in the train to merge. Instead, a new train calculation and order will occur, which will recognize the first non-failing item is now the first in the train, um, canceling the failure point in its previous train. Um, this is uh, a, the great next step to what we were really working towards. Um, the previous MBC of the sequential uh, was really just a, you know, a starting point, and now this is uh, landing us uh, in an exciting addition to drive efficiency in our pipelines at scale, and something we're excited to bring in this upcoming release. Um, another item that we're excited to bring forth, uh, which is a stage of our progressive delivery, is the user ID based access for feature flags. Um, so this is a great uh, addition in the fact that we will allow, um, today you have feature flags that you can turn on and turn off. Um, another important step of that is being able to manage uh, the users who have uh, the ability to see and experience those features. Um, so what we'll allow is user IDs uh, through an API uh, called Unleash um, that will allow um, you to add your users. They don't have to be GitLab users, um, the way that it's executed, um, to be uh, enabled uh, for that feature in that environment. Um, and this will allow for very targeted testing and potentially for um, progressive delivery and future Canary releases. So that's pretty exciting. Um, also, we have the um, pre-release status for releases. So today, um, not just for our users, but also our GitLab team, um, we would like, you know, we most likely the ability to start defining uh, a release and making it visible before it's truly 
ready uh, to be uh, to be committed. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add the ability to um, create a draft release and tag that um, so that similar to how we do roadmaps, we'll able to start to formulate uh, our draft releases um, versus a uh, fully committed release. Um, and then real quickly, um, a, a modification enhancement that had a lot of uh, user community feedback was um, making uh, the delete an environment uh, capability uh, available in the UI. Um, so basically, um, you had to do that via the API um, to delete an environment, but now we're adding this into our user interface where you can delete that environment very uh, right next to uh, the stop button of the environment. Um, so really exciting release for us um, moving forward in um, the release stage of some key things for our strategy. So we're excited. Thank you. Back to you, Luca. Thank you. Um, so we actually don't have anyone to cover for secure today, unfortunately. So we're going to skip over that and go straight to configure. Daniel. Thank you, Luca. Um, so I, uh, we're excited to begin work on bringing key native at the group and instance level for your Kubernetes cluster. So this means that you will be able to deploy those apps that scale themselves up and down to zero um, at, at the clusters that you have installed at either group or instance level. Um, additionally, we have a couple of improvements for Auto DevOps. Um, more, more specifically, the first one is around not running Auto DevOps when there is no Docker file or matching build pack for your project. So as you know, Auto DevOps relies on uh, Heroku-ish to kind of know how to build your app, and that makes use of build packs that come kind of in a limited set of languages. So if your project does not fit one of, the, of those languages or you don't have a Docker file, Auto DevOps will not uh, try to build it. So that will not result in a fail, failed pipeline. And then the second one is that uh, Auto DevOps will not run when there's not a runner uh, that can be used for your project. Uh, so currently, um, if there is no runner in all um, allocated for any kind of build, you kind of will just see a hanging build. Uh, so we'll remove that so um, to let you know that there's no runner that can take care of this build. Um, then the next couple of improvements are for the Kubernetes integration. Uh, as you know, currently you have the ability to uninstall the runner Helm chart when it's deployed from the GitLab managed apps page. Uh, so we will provide kind of the same capability for both the Jupyter Hub and Ingress. Um, the next one is that we will be removing the ability to create a non RBAC uh, cluster in the cluster creation with GCP. And basically, uh, Google Cloud has, um, uh, they have deprecated uh, non RBAC clusters. So basically, ABAC uh, clusters are now deprecated. Uh, so we want to remove that capability from the front end so you get the most uh, secure cluster possible. And then the last one, it's um, a security um, improvement uh, for the deployment of Keynative, uh, which will allow the use of GVisor. And GVisor is a technology that sandboxes your containers so they don't have access to one another. So it, could they run in a more secure way and prevent uh, you know, any kind of security threat where if someone breaks out of the container, it would have access to the neighboring containers. Um, uh, so we will uh, um, implement the use of the security feature in California. And that is all for the computer team. Back to you. Thank you, Luca. Thank you. Over to Sarah for Monitor. Thank you, Luca. My name is Sarah Wildner, and I am a product manager for the monitoring team. So I've got two main themes for what we're going to be working on this month. Uh, the first two issues have to do with enriching issues with content and different actions. So this will be the first wave of enrichment that we're doing. We will be adding the ability for users to link and then embed metrics visualizations directly in an issue. So this is going to be focused on our incident management product category. Instead of having to navigate away from the incident in question during a firefight, if you're working with a team to resolve an outage, you're going to have access to those metrics directly within the issue, showing you exactly what happened and how you might resolve that. You also have access to navigate to the metrics dashboard for a bigger picture vision of what's going on. And the second one, both 
uh, vital to our incident management initiative for 2019, but also useful across all of our stages, those that depend upon issues for workflows, is the ability to embed Zoom calls directly in an issue. So this is going to look like a user generates a Zoom link and embeds it in the description of the issue. And we will identify that and serve as a button at the top of the issue, providing people an easy way to hop into a call or collaborate with other people without having to dig for or use other methods of communication to seek out um, the call that's ongoing. And the last one along our theme of self-monitoring is we're going to be adding a default project within new self-managed instances of GitLab so that administrators of our customers and also administrators of our support team are able to see insights into the health of our customers' GitLab instance. In order to surface this experience in a native way, similar to how we would interact with an application that they've deployed to GitLab, we're going to be adding a default project to all GitLab instances, specifically for visualizing and configuring the monitoring of that GitLab instance. So this will eventually extend to creating instances when your GitLab instance is behaving incorrectly. But as an MVC, when people stand up a new instance of GitLab, there will be a self-monitoring project, both for them to have insights into their instance's health and also for us to be able to better support our customers. Thank you, and on to Eric for distribution. Thank you, Sarah. Um, happy to cover the distribution team this month as well. Um, the first issue is a holdover from the last release. Um, the distribution team is going to be very much focused on continuing to work on supporting um, Geo for Helm charts. And so this is, a, this is obviously a, something we've had in the backlog for a long time. We've been working on it for a few months. There's a few more things to finish up in 12.1 and then hopefully um, in the 12.1 release, Geo will be fully supported in our Helm charts. The second issue for distribution is uh, in line with our, um, our general strategy for um, GitLab to play really, really nicely with OpenShift. And so one of the, the limitations of the OpenShift router is that it only allows traffic over port 80 and 443, which is HTTP and HTTPS. So one of the things that we're looking into is how to um, accept Git traffic over SSH you know, using the OpenShift router, or at least um, surfacing it in deployments that are using OpenShift. And so we'll be spiking into this and uh, either updating our documentation on workarounds or um, finding a, a first class native way to, to go and fix um, this particular issue with the OpenShift router. I also have the next group and I wanted to just quickly level set and introduce the group. This is the first time that the memory team has, has been referenced in the, uh, in, the, in the release call here, uh, or the kickoff call, uh, pardon me. And I wanted to just highlight what the team is responsible for. So it's a new team that we've, that we've bootstrapped. And this team is responsible for reducing the memory footprint of the GitLab application and ensuring that we are responsible and we are being good stewards of the resources um, that our customers are uh, essentially giving us as we um, give them our software. And so we want, we want GitLab to be a, a lightweight application that runs well on a variety of hardware platforms, a variety of clouds, uh, even some um, more kind of abstract and off the wall deployments like Raspberry Pis. We wanna make sure that the, the code that we're writing is um, as efficient as possible with respect to performance and some of the, the resources that um, servers and CPUs and um, systems are giving us. And so we formed a memory team to tackle those problems. Um, and I'm really, really excited to highlight um, two themes that the team is focused on uh, in 12.1. Uh, the first theme is we want to ensure that we are um, using the right technologies in our application. Um, our web server currently is Unicorn, and there's a concurrent web server out there for Ruby called Puma. Puma is actually part of GitLab. It's included in GitLab, but the support is experimental right now. Um, however, enabling Puma should allow us to reduce the memory required by the GitLab application um, significantly as it can handle more than one web request at a time unlike Unicorn. And so we've been working on this for a while. This issue um, is slated for 12.1. And so we're going to enable Puma by default, which should really help with the memory consumption of the application. Um, the second issue is also really important 
Um, and it's aimed at getting better visibility into the memory usage during our internal development cycle. So some, we, have, we have a hard time answering um, some questions such as um, when we add new code, how much memory are we adding to the boot of the GitLab application? How much uh, memory does you know, adding a new Ruby gem uh, add to the memory requirements? How much memory allocation during application initialization is required to run the components that we're developing? We wanna be able to answer these questions more responsibly uh, and more efficiently. In order to do that, we need to get some more metrics. And so the second issue, the gather derailed benchmarks results as part of metrics is, is doing just that. It's allowing us to be more self-aware about what we're measuring, uh, it's it's allowing us to get better metrics with respect to memory and then of course feeding that data back into our development team so that we can uh, be more responsible when we develop new features uh, with respect to our <coughs> memory requirements. So really excited that this team is now bootstrapped and that we're making progress and excited to see what comes out of that. Luca, that's it for memory. Awesome, thanks Eric. Cool, so I'm loving some of the creative focus stuff that's happening over in Kai's camp in Create. There's some super cool analytics and metrics functionality coming in Measure and Monitor, and then lots of exciting and long-awaited improvements in Plan and Verify. Um, really cool stuff, it really is the best release ever, I think. Um, since we had a skip secure in Geo today, I'd like to encourage you all to go check out those issues. Um, thank you all for your time. Looking forward to this, this stuff coming out. Take care, everyone. <laughs>